Grub Street Lodger, and today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to look at the 1994 film Princess Caribou, and I'm also going to look at this biography of Princess Caribou by John Wells. Now what's a bit strange about this is, technically this book does come first. It comes out two weeks before the film. But the film is not based on the book. They're both written by the same person, John Wells. And so I'm going to look at how he took the historical material and he made a biography on one hand and a biopic on the other hand and how they're different. But I'm not only going to do that. I'm going to look at this 2015 young adult novel, The Curious Tale of the Lady Caribou by Katherine Johnson, which she says is heavily based on this book. And so we're going to look at the real historical facts as far as we know them and how they've been made into three different media, uh, a biography, a biopic, and a young adult novel. Now this means I've had to have chopped this up and really think about the structure. So I've got this in sections. And the first section is going to start now. I got the facts from the biography. It is the most complete version of the story I can find. And so uh, just bear that in mind as I talk about it. So what happened? Well, in the village of Almondsbury, just outside of Bristol, a young lady was seen. She was wearing a black dress and she had a black shawl wrapped around her head like a turban. She didn't speak any English. And when they took her to a pub, she wouldn't drink any beer and she washed her cup out between every single drink and she wouldn't eat any meat. She was a bit of a curiosity. So they took her to the vicar and he didn't know what to do with her. So they took her to Knoll House, which is where the Worrells lived. And they were sort of a bigwig family of the area, one of the sort of leading families of Bristol. He was uh, the owner of a bank and he had lots of other business interests. She was actually American and she was involved in sort of blue stocking stuff. She was, uh, you know, interested in lots of different things, particularly ethnology and things like that. And so they took her in and the husband didn't really want her there. So he shipped her out to Bristol where she was put on trial because you weren't allowed to be a vagrant then it was against the law and while she was there she distinguished herself she again didn't speak any English she refused to sleep in a bed sharing with anybody which was a common practice then even in like inns and things and also she went on hunger strike and I thought this this woman this girl she was in her 20s there's something odd about her so they brought her back to Knoll House and brought in sort of experts and scientists, most of them uh, self-proclaimed experts and scientists. So there was a, a Captain Palmer who knew about sort of the, the area around Java and the Indonesian Isles, and there were other people. They sent her writing. She did this kind of weird sort of writing that was a bit Chinese, a bit Arabic, a bit Hebrew. They sent it off to Oxford, who actually declared the writing absolute humbug. And also they had somebody called Wilkinson, and Wilkinson was sort of the local clever guy. He was the local renaissance man. He was going around trying to sell gas to people, actually, that was his job. But he was interested in everything, and he had um, a lot of respect in the area for being very clever. And he looked at her, and he um, you know, examined her, and he concluded that she was, in fact, from a long way away. She was. She claimed she was from Java Sioux. And as they sort of began to learn each other's languages, um, they learned that she was a princess. And she did all sorts of odd things. She used to sit on the roof praying to Allah Tala. And this was one of the things that made them think she might be genuine because Allah, of course, being you know the God of Islam. So there were little bits of reality threaded through there. Uh, and they were wondering, you know, who is this person? And can she get us access to a spice aisle? Because money, money, money. And this went on for a few months. And she was sort of talking the town. And Wilkinson wrote all these descriptions about it and sent them everywhere. This was not good for Princess Caribou. Because, well, it spread her fame. And one of the people reading it sort of recognised some of the story. Because the story that was put out was that Princess Caribou had been abducted from her island of Java Sioux, that she'd been travelled around sort of as a slave, and she'd jumped out at the Bristol Channel and found her way in England. And it reminded them of stories that their old sort of maid used to tell their daughter. So they turned up, and they declared, that's not a princess from faraway lands, that's 
That's Mary Wilcox or Mary Baker. She went under both surnames. She's a cobbler's daughter from Devon. And so she was found out. And to avoid uh, scandal or <laughs> to minimise scandal, because there already was quite a lot of scandal, they uh, shipped her off to America where she tried to do the caribou thing on the circuit, but it didn't really work out. And then she came back and she became a leech farmer. Uh, it's one of the things that the biography found out. Uh, and so that's the story of Lady Caribou. Six months of impressive and entertaining and theatrical deception, uh, where this cobbler's daughter pretended to be a real princess. Now, how did she get there? That's also an interesting story. So she ran off from her little village in Devon called Witheridge, and she ran off to Exeter, the, the, the local sort of town, you know, not exactly city, and she came back, and then she ran off to London, and she was prone to um, fevers and things like that, and she collapsed at Hyde Park, and she was taken in by St Giles, the poor hospital, where she was given bleeding on the back of the neck to help her with the, um, help her with the fever, which wouldn't have done much, to be honest, but that's what they did. They were trying to help. Uh, and then she worked for people in London. And then she does something really weird. She decides to join the Magdalene or Magdalene. It's spelt Magdalene. I'm saying Magdalene because the college in Cambridge is Magdalene. Uh, I don't know which was right. But the Magdalene Institute, which was uh, a charitable institute for reformed prostitutes. And she said she joined that because she liked the clothes. Um, and she gave this, this tale and it's all written up in their in their records that still exist, and it, it sounds like a made up tale. You know, it doesn't sound real. And she lived there for a bit, and then she left there, and then she went back to um, Exeter, and then she went back to London. And by this point, she changed her surname to Baker, and she had a child, and she had about six different stories about where this child came from and who the dad was and things like that. And the child ended up at the Foundling Institute, which is another great London charitable institute, and her records are all there. And her story there was different to the one she told papers later to what she told her family. Um, this is what I find really interesting about this story. You've got this woman who, one, she tries out all the great charitable institutions of London. But two, she all the, her employers say that she was very reliable, that she was a very good worker, but she was eccentric, she was peculiar, and she liked telling stories. And I'm really interested in the idea of this woman who made her daydreams into reality, who became Caribou. And I think that's really interesting. And so that's that would be my focus were I to write a Caribou novel or a Caribou film. But we shall see. So there are the facts. Now the biography tells it pretty much as I told it. It tells the first bit about Caribou as caribou and you're kind of wondering is she real is she not you're not really wondering because there's no place called java Sioux, but you know that there's that mystery in there and then it's the hard cut of no she's called mary she's from devon and then the second bit was her pre-life and this is the bit where the uh, biography is most impressive because he goes and he checks all these sources so the main thing he's working from is a book by a man called gutch and gutch wrote about it after it had been revealed, when she was sort of in a waiting prison while they're trying to work out what to do with her in a way that one wasn't too cruel and two just got rid of the embarrassment. If they made like a big deal of punishing her, too embarrassing. So they had to slip her away. And so the, the author, John Wells, he's gone through Gutch's thing um, and he's gone around checking as much as possible. And it's amazing how much is true, but it's also amazing how much she's made up, like, or may have made up, we we don't know. There's a story about her going back from London back to the West Country before she becomes caribou, and she's going in man's clothes, and some high women accost her and try to get her to do a, a crime with them. And it's like, really? Did that happen? Did that not happen? Very hard to tell. Mary Baker, uh, Mary Baker slash Mary Wilcox, seems to have been a died in the war fantasist. So how much is true and how much isn't, but there's enough documentary evidence and he's gone and found it all, and that's good. Also interestingly about this biography is there's a third section. And this third section I'd like more biographies to have because it's the how I wrote this biography section. And it starts off with how he got into the topic. He was um, he was attracted, attracted, he was got by the uh, director of the you know, forthcoming caribou film 
and told this story and, and told, right, can you find out more about it? Can you turn it into a script? And he obviously fell in love with the idea of Caribou and he fell in love with Mary Wilcox and because uh, he, he had enough material really to write a script, but he went all the way to write a book uh, and quite a comprehensive book, the extent that he goes to check all these sources and then to find her relatives and find out more stories about her coming back to England and becoming uh, a leech, not a leech farmer, but a leech dealer, <laughs> which I think is really cool, I deal in leeches, which was quite a good little business and um, yeah, she died of old age. She actually died of a stroke in the middle of the street. And and the extent, he must have fallen in love with her to some extent to have bothered with all this. And the last third is about him doing that, travelling around the country, meeting people, uh, finding documents, putting things together, talking to other caribou enthusiasts and things like that. And I would like more biographies to do that because one of the best things when a biographer comes to the Dr. Johnson reading group is to ask them what got you into this, you know, what did you take out of it, and, and how did you do it? Um, I'd like to write a biography one day, that'd be good fun. I'd like to write one of Goldsmith or maybe Leon Garfield, because he hasn't got one, he deserves one, he was, a, he was a very good writer. Anyway, so it's very much a pop biography, there's no index, um, you know, it's, it's made to sell based on the interest of the film, you know, that's the cover, that's the only cover, this is the only edition. But it's very good and, and very detailed. My only thing is, as I said, he, he got into her, he, he sort of fell in love with her. Um, I get the impression physically as well. There were a couple of portraits of her. He'd never met her, obviously, she was dead. But he keeps talking about her, her beautiful eyes and her shapely you know, arms and her, her budding breasts and things. And you think... Dude, she, she's she's dead. Don't go there. <laughs> and also, at the time, she's too young for you. But hey, that's just a strange thing I thought about this. Um, but otherwise, it's a it's a very good biography and um, a very good pop one. So now, let's look at how the film tells the story. Now the film mostly tells the first part of this biography, but it changes a few things. Um, Gutch, who wrote the book um, that sort of was the starting point of this, becomes a character in the film, and he becomes a detective, and that's so they can add more backstory. This is what Wells says about what he changed to get into the film. So, uh, ba 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 ba. We simplified certain elements concentrating on the time at Null and giving Mary a less complicated past. We made Gutch a younger unmarried man and, as it turned out when we came to cast it, a younger unmarried Irish man. We turned his short infatuation, which I'm not convinced there was a short infatuation, but in this book he is convinced that Gutch sort of fell in love with her a little bit. So a short infatuation with her into a serious romantic passion. But the more I read about Gutch, the more I thought it was justified. We also expanded the tea party with two ladies, so uh, Caribou, as Caribou was taken to a tea party with some you know, well-to-do ladies, and we expanded it into um, a ball for the Prince Regent. And, and that's what he says he changes. And there is a bit more change than that from, from the, the real thing. You know, they've shaped it. They've, um, they wanted to include some of the backstory about the Magdalene House and things like that, so they have Gutch finding it out. And putting Gutch as a character then means that he has something to do to find out the backstory and he falls in love with her. And so there's a happy ending at the end where he joins her on their ship to America and they go off together. Which very much did not happen. Um, as it says, they focus on the Knoll House. So the whole sort of premise of the film is that is she, isn't she, kind of thing. Uh, all the trailers and that sort of dealt in that. Is she this this strange princess from another world, or is she a fake? And Gutch finds out she's a fake, but doesn't chooses not to say. And they have the same thing that the um, former employee turns up to um, recognise her. And it happens while she's being painted uh, for one of the paintings she had. Um, that's going to come up later, if I remember. 
uh, and other changes. So they focus on Nullhouse, they focus on um, Wilkinson, who's played by that guy from Third Rock from the Sun, whose name I've forgotten, and they have a bit of fun. And um, they focus on the Greek servant, Phrixos, they call him in this, and he's played by Kevin Klein. and Phrixos is initially sceptical, and he does little tricks like this. You are a fraud. I know you are a fraud and I have spit in your soup. Now, person, I have beast in it. And actually, in real life, there was a Greek servant. The name isn't named in the book. But he did things like run in, chat, fire, fire, to see if she did anything. And she didn't. And there was another time when Mrs. Worrell was kind of doubting and uh, and they're in a carriage and Caribou was asleep and she woke her up suddenly to see if she would say something in English like, oh, bugger, you know, but she didn't. Uh, and they show the odd things that Caribou does, her strange language, uh, her sitting in trees, her praying on the hills. What they don't show is one of the things that um, made the story a little titillating. Namely, she liked to swim naked in the in the lake. They don't show that. But yeah, that's the focus. And then there's this whole other element that they've added where the gnolls aren't quite, you know, they're, they're, they're not landed gentry. They're, they're people with money and power, but they're not quite up there. And so they want to, and they're hoping that Princess Caribou will get them into the next echelon of society. But in fact, those people are just horrible, and <laughs> they come and essentially kidnap her and take her to a Regency ball. Which is a very good little dance. It means you get a sort of fun foppish version of the Prince Regent, played by John Sessions. Royal Highness, the Prince Regent! And also, one of the evil lords is uh, Edward Tudor Pole. Oh, I see, that is fun. Who is Tempole Tudor, who was the second host of Crystal Maze and did uh, Swords of a Thousand Men. Anyway, I like Ed Tudor Pole. He did Who Killed Bambi. Uh, I love Who Killed Bambi. For no reason, here's a clip of Who Killed Bambi. Who Killed Bambi? And so there you have it. They've they've done what they said they did. They simplified it. They added a love story with a happy ending, and uh, they focused on Caribou and not Mary Wilcox. Uh, as for performances, uh, Stephen Weir is Gutch. I like Stephen Weir. He was probably my favourite interpretation of Inspector Bucket in uh, Dis uh, Disney's <laughs> BBC's Dickensian. If you saw that, uh, which I saw a long time after it happened, but. He was really good in that, and I like him in stuff. But he doesn't have passion. <laughs> he says things like, I feel very passionate for her. To me, she was the most wonderful creature in the world. If she is uh, not a princess and she's just pretending, then she's a really impressive person and I really quite love her. I'll do whatever I can for you, Mary, I promise. And I just can't believe in that passion. And then on the other hand, you've got Phoebe Cates. And I love Phoebe Cates. She's the best thing in Gremlins. Uh, but when she's caribou, she's her, her caribou voice is really squeaky. She's like, eh, 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 skip it up, skip it up, no, sleep. And it's a bit, I don't know, precious, I think. The caribou's a bit precious. She doesn't come across as a fierce warrior queen to me. She comes across as a... Uh, uh, Manic pixie dream Java Sue princess. Yeah. It doesn't quite work. And then when she's revealed to be Mary Walcott, she has the worst Devon accent you've ever heard. It was easy. When I was her, the princess, I was her. Everything after her being caribou just sounds rotten. <laughs> you know, I don't think she's awful. I think. She looks the part, and she's very good at being this theatrical person, but um, she doesn't quite live it. And in fact, that's the problem with the film for me. It is shaped, and I get why you would shape it, but as such, it doesn't have any teeth. It's very bland. It's presented in a kind of, um, you know, adaptation of a, a well-known book, style and it, it the, 
the whole caribou thing is is sort of oh oh how how thrilling but it's not it, it, there's no oomph to it you one they keep talking about what danger she might be in for for making these people look silly but you don't really believe that she's in danger but two you don't really believe she's making them look silly it's just oh, this is something interesting that's happened in their life and it's made things more interesting around here. You get the impression if they found out she was a fake, which they do, they wouldn't really care because at least it changed their boring lives. And the whole film just kind of flat. I think part of that also the romance with Gutch. One, I don't think Gutch is the right person to have a romance with her. Um, he's, he's a newspaper person who barely meets her. Uh, but two... The performances, it just doesn't work as a romance. And so the film is not all that great, I'm afraid. Um, it's just a bit flat. But let's see how a more modern writer does in a novel. So in 2015, uh, Catherine Johnson wrote The Curious Tale of the Lady Caribou. Now this is a ya novel. Um, when I see acronyms, I just have to say them as they are. So it's a yeah, or young adult. And she has a, an epilogue in the back where she, she gives the main sort of real details of, of Caribou. And she says here a little bit about what she's changed and what she's done with it. My account doesn't follow Mary's life in every respect. I've changed the date and Mary's age. Cassandra, she's going to come in a minute, never existed. But most of the bones of the story are firmly based in truth. Even the language Caribou uses in my book is the one Mary Wilcox made up herself. And a little bit later she says, I relied on many books in researching her story, but it's clear that the story changed depending on who you were talking to and when. If you're interested in as much of the truth as possible, the best source has to be Princess Caribou, Her True Story by John Wells. So she's read this. She's probably seen the film, to be honest. And she thought, right, I'm going to take this and I'm going to tell my own story with it. Um, and here's the note, I am not Don the Adaptation Critic or History Buffs. I don't put a ding when things are different. Things have to be different. What interests me is what changes to source material and to history and things say about the purpose of the, the, the book and the, the kind of audience and uh, the author and also what they say about the original um, story themselves. And so... This starts off with two made-up things straight away. Three made-up things straight away. Uh, it starts off in the head of Mary Wilcox. So we instantly are going to know throughout that Caribou is not true. There's not going to be the will they won't, uh, is she, isn't she type teasing that the film does. Uh, we know instantly she's called Mary, and by the end of the first chapter, she's become Caribou. But why? Well, it starts off with a really quite graphic rape scene. Now, I don't like rape scenes. I'm of the opinion, if you don't need one, don't have one. Um, and there was no rape in the, in, the, um, in the original thing. So this has been added. Um, another thing, as she's having that done to her, she's remembering her dead baby. Now, you may remember there was a baby, but the baby went to the founding hospital, grew up into a man, not dead. So that instantly... There is a dead baby and a rape scene invented for this story. Now, I find that a bit icky, but I can see why. Because the, the sort of the, the thesis, I suppose, that Catherine uh, Johnson has is that she becomes caribou out of trauma. This is her reaction to uh, the trauma of the baby and then the sort of inciting incident, and the rape. So that she decides she doesn't want to be Mary Wilcox anymore, that Mary Wilcox has had a shit life. And she's going to be something better. She's going to be Princess Caribou. Uh, and this is the why she becomes it. And when she is Princess Caribou and we're in her head, it's really interesting because she, she uh, is the princess in some ways. And she's always thinking, well, what would the princess do? And if someone is looking at her and sort of sneering at her, she just looks straight back because that's what a princess would do. And I am a princess. And it's a very, um, it's like a shield, a protection against the world. And also it allows her to sort of rediscover her own power and her own autonomy. And I found that a very interesting um, take on it. 
my take on it was it was a daydreamer who gets overwhelmed by her daydreams. But her take on it was, you know, trauma has has made her go into this character, uh, though she had to invent the trauma to make that happen. The other thing she invents in the first uh, chapter, and in fact the cover, is that Mary Wilcox is mixed race. Now this doesn't seem to exist for many reasons. Uh, you'd think you'd be there to discuss race, but it isn't except people go, oh look, she has brown skin. And it kind of annoys me because Mary Wilcox was one not mixed race. Uh, in fact, when she was being Caribou, one of the main objections to her was that, oh, she's kind of white. And her face shape and structure, and I mean, she does just look like a dark-haired European. Uh, you know, it was it was the consistency of her behaviour that that won people over. You know, so so to change that changes the central dynamic of the con in some ways, um, and and also does it for not much reason. Not much is done with it. I think it almost seems like oh. That's done. We'll, we'll, we'll make her that. That'll make it relevant or something. It doesn't quite. I don't get that change. Um, now the next chapter has another change. Cassandra, who was mentioned, who was made up. Now this is an invented world daughter, and again, it's another change I don't completely understand, because one of the reasons Mrs. Worrell really took to Caribou is she'd had a daughter who died. And there's this, um, they, they shared letters even after the whole events, even um, when when um, Mary Wilcox was going to America afterwards, they shared letters. And they're quite intimate letters. And there's, there's kind of this thing of, of, of Mrs. Worrell wanting a daughter and sort of adopting Caribou as a daughter. And this is one of the reasons she gets sort of taken in by it. But in this, she has a daughter. Well, okay, well, what does the daughter exist to do in the plot? And the answer is not much. Um, she's trying to choose between a guy who loves her, who's who's nice and hunky, but poor, and a guy who sees her as a sort of a trophy, uh, is very charming and attractive and rich. And she has to choose between these two people. She first chooses one, realises it's not um, going to work, and then chooses the other. And we get a little epilogue where she's had a horrible marriage with him. So, why is Cassandra in this book? I assume because Yar novels need love triangles. And, and that Princess Caribou can't be involved in one. I honestly have no idea why she's in the book. Uh, and then the third point of view character is uh, the, the existent son of, um, of the Walls. Who is really nasty. Again, we introduced to him being extremely unpleasant to a prostitute in London. Uh, and leaving her, he sort of teased that he's going to look after her, and then he's like, nah, we're done, mate. I've paid you, you've shagged me, it's all done, bye-bye. And off he goes. And um, there's a sort of subplot of Mary Caribou trying to get him to fall in love with her so she can break his heart, but then they actually fall in love, and this is where our contrived happy ending is going to come later. Uh, so this, so not Gutch, but, but uh, Worrell. Again, not true. She went off alone. Actually, she went off with three um, members of the Moravian uh, religious sect. Uh, that was who she went to the boat in America with. And so the, these changes, okay, okay. So she, again, it's focused on her at Knoll House. And she's doing her thing, you know, she's praying, she's doing her weird scribble, she's saying her language. And there are some experts there. Uh, Wilkinson is mentioned, but the one in this didn't exist and in fact what he does he's into phrenology uh it's a bit early for phrenology really and he's into electric stuff now there was electric stuff because uh things like the celestial bed used electricity but he essentially has an electroshock therapy thing that he puts on her head and burns her hair um again made up i think for the drama for the nastiness uh, and then Captain Palmer, who was a very minor character in this, who uh, he pretends to speak her language. Uh, and, and that means he's sort of in on it. And he uses this to blackmail her 
and to threaten to rape her again. And then it all comes out again while she's having her portrait painted and um, she goes off to America and guess who comes with her? Um, the young Worrell. And so there are the bones of the caribou story in here. There is the deception and things. But there's all this extra stuff or change stuff. And all of it, to me, seems sort of nasty and, and, and sordid and manipulative. This is, this is what I came to the conclusion with this novel. Um, my first thought was just it was trying to shove the caribou story in a, in a yar. Uh, thing and the yard thing needed a you know a love triangle and it needed a bit of shocking stuff and so that was but I began to feel no this book's trying to manipulate me it's trying to make me care by adding all this nastiness in and I already cared without the nastiness so I I actually find this book a little despicable to be quite honest um, and as I say it's not because it makes changes it's because of the changes it makes the changes it makes are all unpleasant um, and nasty and trying to pull your, your heartstrings. And I thought there was enough in the real story. And so we're going to come to a conclusion. Of course, the written biography is the best account of her life. Uh, though in some ways we can't know because it's still a creative product, but you know, it's got the research, it's got uh, the argument, it's got all of that. Of course it is, because that's exactly what it's designed to do. So it does that better. So if you want the truth, or as close to the truth as you're going to get, that. But in terms of shaping it into a story, the film goes too bland, and this book goes too unpleasant. Um... For me, this is how I would do it. Uh, I found the most interesting thing, as I said, to be how this person becomes caribou. How uh, someone who, she runs away a lot and she tells stories and she, you know, she's obviously quite pleasant and pleasing. Uh, she always gets employment with people and then quits and then does some of she She can't stay still. So I would tell it as, as from the beginning almost, or uh, from her arriving in London and, and fainting at Hyde Park, so, and then a little bit of flashback or something. So you've got this dreamer who who has this huge imagination that is, is being squashed or contained by everywhere she is, and she keeps trying to find ways to live a wonderful imagined life and and find keep butting against reality so she joins the more the maudlin because she likes their clothes and she suddenly thinks oh yeah i could be this 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 sort of serious person and then she does it and she finds it annoying and you know she she goes to london and then she goes back and then she goes back and she goes back she can't find her place and then using so the reason she started being caribou according to her was that she got more money begging as caribou um, when she was on the road because people were more inclined to give money to this interesting foreigner than just you know, another, another English beggar. And so she does that and she gets more, as I would tell it, she gets more in love with being caribou. And, and so all the know-how stuff, I would do it all from her perspective, I feel. So all the know-how stuff, she's not, hee-hee, look at these silly rich people who think I'm caribou or hee-hee, look at these... Um, you know, uh, people who think they're intellectuals and I'm conning them all. No, she just she just really loves being this person. She really she she almost forgets who she is um, at times, and and the real Cabu seemed to have there was a big library at Knoll House of ethnographic stuff because Mrs. Worrell was into that, and she seemed to have had a little sneaky peek to get some ideas. So she's doing that, but I don't think she's doing that to con them. Not in my my telling in my telling she's doing that because it's feeding her imagination and then when she gets found out it's a massive oh fuck uh i don't know how i'd end it would i end with her as a leech saleswoman in in bristol would i end with her going on a ship i wouldn't have a love uh interest i know there are things that that felt needed in a mainstream film or a book but no this is her story this is about her 
and her relationship with her own creation. That, that's my, that's how I would tell it uh, if I were going to. Out of the tellings I've got, I mean, the biography was the one that I found most interesting because it had all the weird real life twists and turns. Oh, she's at the founding now. Oh, she's doing this, doing that. Um, yeah, and the film's a bit too bland and the, 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 the Yar book is a bit too grimy, manipulative, unpleasant. I just didn't like it. Uh, so there you go. A look at three versions of Princess Caribou. Next, I think I'm going to look at how you win Oscars with 18th century source material. So there we go. I wish I were a princess. I wish I were a princess. Here, Caribou boy. Here, Caribou boy. Oh, shut up, tadpole.